Okay, so this is part two. I'm starting up on question number eight. When I ended the previous video, I, my brain was twisted and I didn't do that right. So when we go through to, to balance these nuclear reactions, probably the easiest way to do this first off is we're going to take a look at the atomic numbers here. So we've got boron 5 plus a neutron is going to change into helium. So we need to find, we need to keep the same number of protons going on here. So when we take a look here, um, 5 minus 2 is going to be the element atomic number 3, lithium. So we know it's going to be lithium, and its atomic number is going to be 3 because these numbers need to add up. And then over here, we've got 10 plus 1. We've got a mass of 11. So we've got 11, and we've four of our masses are in our helium. So 11 minus 4, is that going to be 7? Yes, it is. So it'll be lithium 7 will be produced. What particle is needed to complete this nuclear reaction? So we've got, this is a mercury, and it's reacting with, with a heavy isotope of hydrogen. This is hydrogen 2, which means it has a total mass of 2. It has one proton, and then it also has one neutron, since it has the mass of 2. So we just need to figure out, since we have beta decay occurring here, since we have the helium nucleus, we just need to figure out what the other, uh, what mercury is going to break down into. So we've got to keep our mass the same. So we've got atomic number of, of 80 plus 1. So we're going to have 81. We still need to have 81 protons over here. We have two protons in the helium. So 81 minus 2 is going to be 79. Ooh, and if I remember right, that's our favorite element, gold. Yes, it is. So it'll be the element gold. Now we need to keep the masses up here the same. So we've got a mass of 202 when we add up these two masses here. And then we know we have four already from the helium, so we got to do 200, excuse me, 202 minus the mass here of four. Because in a beta decay, the mass of the particle produced is going to go down by four. And that's going to give us 198, if I've done my math right. 198, 99, 100, and one, there we go. So it'll be gold, 198 that's formed. What particle is needed to complete this nuclear reaction? So we've got lead breaking down into bismuth. Now let's take a look here. The atomic number is increasing by one. So this is going to be a beta decay, which means one of the neutrons is going to change into a proton. We're going to, the other particle we're going to get is going to be an electron with zero charge, excuse me, zero mass and negative one charge. And if we take a look here, we should see that the masses are the same. But what's different here is we've gained one proton, and then we've also created an electron that counterbalances that, that change in charge. And let's see. In this nuclear reaction, what do letters C and D represent? So C, that's going to represent the, the mass number. It's the mass number, which is protons plus, you got to add them up, plus the neutrons in the nucleus. This tells you the mass of the element. D here is representing, it's going to, the atomic number, which is just the number of protons. So if you get asked a question, they're going to ask you how many neutrons. You take the mass number and you subtract the atomic number, and that'll tell you how many neutrons. Number 12, half-life of material is 12 days long. How many days will it take for three quarters of the original amount to decay? Well, I'm going to just draw this square, and this is 100% of our original mass, whatever the radioactive element is, in 12 days. Half of it will be broken down, and I highly recommend draw these graphs. So after 12 days, we have half of it remaining. After another 12 days, Half of this will be remaining, which gives us one quarter left, 12 days. Now let's make sure what the question is. How many days will it take for three quarters of the original amount to decay? Well, after these 24 days, because I've added up these two half-lives, there is only one quarter remaining. Three quarters of it has decayed, and we've answered the, the question. After 32 days, for number 13, 30, uh, 20 milligrams of iodine-131 one has decayed into 5 milligrams. What is the half-life? So I'm going to start over here with iodine-131. We have 20 milligrams that we started with. And let's see. 
when we do this, and we're asking for the half-life. So we don't know the half-life yet. So after the first half-life generation, we're gonna have half of this remaining, 10 milligrams of iodine-131. After another half-life generation, there'll be half of this remaining, which will be five grams of iodine-131. So now we've reached our, our five milligrams. It tells us in the problem that 32 days has occurred from beginning to end. So 32 days. So since we've only had two half-life decays, half of this time, 32 would have to be 16 days, if I did my math right. Well, yeah, so 16 days turns out to be the half-life. Let me adjust this here. Barium 122 has a half-life of 120 seconds. All right, how much of a 100 gram sample will remain after 120 seconds? So we've got barium 122. Its half-life is 120 seconds. We start with 100 grams. And it says after 120 seconds, we will have half of the remaining barium, which will be 50 grams of barium 122 remaining. And I think we've solved our problem. How much of a 100 gram sample remains after 120 seconds? Well, after one half life, there'll be 50 grams remaining. What is the notation of copper with an atomic number of 29 and the mass number of 65? Well, copper, you'd have to look at the, well, atomic number is 29. If you look on the periodic table, copper's symbol is Cu for the Latin word cuprum, and mass number 65. So this is telling you this isotope of copper weighs 65. 29 of the particles in its nucleus are protons. And then when you subtract these two, it's gonna be tell you how many neutrons, which I'm thinking if we subtract 29 from this, we're gonna get, oh, 65, that's gonna be, see if that was 30, that would be 35, but then when I think it, well, okay, you do the subtraction. I'm not quick in my head with numbers. 65 minus 29 will be the number of neutrons if they were to ask you. Number 16. What does the nucleus of an atom Fe55 contain? So first off, Fe is iron. 55 tells you its mass. When you look on the periodic table, iron's atomic number is 26. The nucleus of the atom. In the nucleus of an atom, we have protons and neutrons. We're not worried about the electrons. The atomic number is gonna tell us how many protons we have, so there's 26 protons. And then we have to do some math, 55 minus 26. So let's do the math here, reduce that, let's see six. Nine, so we're gonna have 29 neutrons in the nucleus of the isotope iron 55. Remember, that tells you its mass number. You subtract the atomic number to find neutrons. The notation for carbon 12, well, carbon symbol is C. Since its mass is 12, carbon 12, you put the mass up there, and carbon has six protons. And then the symbol for carbon 14, it, carbon 14 has two extra neutrons, so its mass is a little heavier, but it's still carbon. What's the same and what is different in the subatomic particles between nitrogen seven, excuse me, nitrogen 15 and oxygen 15? Well, on these, what's gonna be different is nitrogen will have seven protons, oxygen will have eight protons, and the difference is when you, the neutrons, let's see, seven, uh, 15 minus seven will be eight neutrons, and let's see, 15 minus eight, will be seven neutrons. So that's what's different. What's the same and what's different between the subatomic particles? Well, and also then oxygen is gonna have eight electrons if we're gonna go there, but usually we're just concerned with what's going on in the nucleus. Since there's seven protons, there'll be seven electrons and nitrogen. What, in the nucleus, what force overcomes proton revulsion? It's the strong nuclear force. This is a force that scientists proposed had to be there because in the nucleus, you've got all these protons. There's some neutrons floating around too with no charge, but these protons are really close to each other and electrostatic repulsions wants to push them apart. So electrostatic forces want to do this, wants to push those charges apart. So scientists theorized there had to be a force and it would have to be really strong that would push those back and they call that the strong nuclear force. 
Number 20, why is the amount of energy released from nuclear fission reaction much greater than the energy released from a chemical reaction? Well, what's happening is when we have a nuclear reaction, we are releasing a small amount, some small amount of matter is being converted into energy. And it's with this equation, E equals mc squared. So if, even if you take a tiny little bit of mass, you know, like 6.0, 6 times 10 to the negative 27 or something for a very small particle, when you multiply it by C, which is 300,000, and that gets squared so it becomes huge, you get a fair amount of energy after that. And when there's billions of these reactions going on, you get a lot of energy. So with nuclear fission reactions as well as fusion, a small amount of matter is being converted into energy following Einstein's relativity equation. Draw and illustrate the difference between fission and fusion. All right, fission, first off, just think of splitting right between the S's. So this would be an example right here. Here is a fission reaction. We started with something big, and we ended up with something smaller, plus some energy. With fusion, Think of the fuse in your car or your house. It connects parts of the circuit together. Fusion, you're starting with smaller stuff. Like with nuclear solar fusion, you get like two protons, two um, hydrogens, and they combine into one big thing. In this case, we get some hydrogens. We end up with helium plus some energy. The only problem is fusion takes a lot of heat to get reacting. Now, for balancing these equations, we're here at the end. Biggest thing is that I notice is that the oxygen. So we need to get it so that um, there's six oxygens on each side because that's the smallest number that will evenly go into three and two. So I'm putting the coefficients two in front of those. And then when I do that, my oxygens are now balanced. I have four aluminums over here now, two times two. So that equation now is balanced. Let me zoom in here so we can see those a little better. Okay, on this one right here, we have two hydrogens formed and two iodines. That's pretty straightforward. We just need a coefficient there. We don't really need to put in the ones, but hey, there they are. Okay, when you go to balance this equation, what really stands out again, the first thing I note, and, and do the, the elements calcium and aluminum last, because you can. that's the last thing you want to do. You want to get these that are tied up in, other, in a bigger molecule together. So we need to get it so these have the same amounts. And again, three and two, the, the common number for those is gonna be six. So I'm gonna multiply this equation by three. That'll give me six chlorines and this one by two. Now it's just a matter of, okay, I've got two aluminums in the aluminum trichloride. So I need to put a coefficient two here and a coefficient three over there. Taking a look at this one right here. When I look at this, the first thing that kind of catches my mind, one thing is I've got two aluminums here and only one. And also, I have two phosphates over here in the reactants and only one over there. So I'm going to put the coefficient 2 over here. So now I have two aluminums and two phosphates and two aluminums. We have our two phosphates. Okay, that's looking good. One sulfate, one sulfate, one calcium, one calcium. This equation is now balanced. So when you work through the process of balancing these combustion equations, you're always going to do the oxygen last. Do the oxygen last. And in the process, when you get started, you know, it looks like, okay, we got nine carbons. So I'm going to put nine here. So I got nine carbons now. I have 18 hydrogens. I only have two over here. So nine times two is 18. Okay, so now we got to count the, the number of oxygens. And nine times two is 18 oxygens in the carbon dioxide plus nine oxygens from the water. If I do my math right, that comes out to be 27 oxygens. So when I come over here, let's see, I have O2. So I need, let's see, well, I need 27 oxygens over here. So half of 27 is going to be uh, 13 and a half. So if I could get 13 and a half oxygens molecules, this equation becomes balanced. Nine and nine, okay. 18 and nine times 18. But the rule is you can't, oh, pardon me, you cannot have half of, an, half of a molecule. So what we do is we're just gonna multiply everything by two. So when we multiply this all by two, this becomes two of this hydrocarbon. This will become 27. This will become 18. And this will become 18. 
This is the coefficients now. So let me just erase what we had before and put the coefficients underneath. So now we're going to have two of this large hydrocarbon, 27 oxygen molecules, 18 carbon dioxides produced, and 18 waters. Now just to double check and make sure, we have 9 times 2 carbons. We have 18 carbons over here. We have 2 times 18 hydrogens. We have 2 times 18 hydrogens here. And we have 27 oxygens. And as we just balanced out here, we now have, um, we're going to end up with, what is that going to be, 54 oxygens when we add those up. So there's the balanced equation. And for types of reaction, let's see. Over here, we're creating something bigger. So this will be synthesis. Over here, we're again, we're, oh, now this one we're breaking down. We start with a bigger molecule, get smaller. This is decomposition. Over here, we get a single replacement. The calcium is kicking out the aluminum, making it over here all by itself. So that's going to be single, oops, single displacement. Over here, we're going to have a double displacement if we take a look because the calcium and aluminum are sw switching partners. So this will be double displacement. My dance analogy, if these are dance couples, they've switched partners. And this is combustion. There we go. I want you to own this test. Bye.